blacksmith is the 14th in the string of 19 silent starring two-reelers that Buster Keaton made in the early 1920s, and the sixth of his 11 releases through First National Pictures. Coming right on the heels of such triumphs as The Playhouse, The Boat, and Cops, the film is often regarded as a lesser work by critics as well as fans. Keaton himself referred to the blacksmith as that dud, largely due to how audiences at the time responded to one particular gag sequence involving the inadvertent destruction of a Rolls Royce, oft rumored to have been a wedding gift from his bride's family. But let's take a closer look at the blacksmith. Does it really deserve dud status amongst Keaton's classic shorts? I think not, and put forth that it is actually one of the absolute delights of this group of films. Tightly produced and rich in detail, the film is without lulls and moves along like a beautiful piece of carefully designed machinery, an achievement of short form comedy construction. The film has one of the most beautiful, imaginative, and outright funny introductions in all of Keaton's films. Three artfully composed titles quote lines from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's classic poem, The Village Blacksmith. Keaton provides us with two boffo gags that are deliciously absurd and instantly illustrate his command of the tools of film language, framing, timing, panning, editing, and comic punctuation. Enter Keaton's ever-reliable stock company heavy, Joe Roberts. Right away, his appearance and behavior here immediately telegraph a distinctly Eric Campbell-like demeanor. His first encounter with his assistant sets the tone. Our hero will not only be at odds with him, but likely in real danger from him. Chaplin used Campbell most effectively in this fashion in his mutual comedies of a few years before, and likewise, Keaton's use of Roberts echoes this especially in his imprisonment, escape, and return to seek vengeance, just like Campbell's Brute in Chaplin's Easy Street. Quite a few of what later came to be known as cartoon gags appear throughout the blacksmith, and they're all executed with relish and are integrated into the piece as masterful little grace notes. The lightning-fast 360-degree spin-around that Buster does via extreme undercranking to register astonishment, the balloon used to hold up the Model T Ford, the payoff of which looks quite dangerous. The elevated hat flip, and the locomotive that stops on a dime, again achieved through the magic of undercranking, so as not to annihilate Buster. This last one a sort of reprise of, and variation on his surreal locomotive entrance in The Goat. Incidentally, Keaton's only other collaboration with writer-director Mal St. Clair during this period. Keaton's real-life affinity for animals was never on better display than in a wonderful one-on-one -on -one sequence with a horse. Its rider, played by Virginia Fox, brings in the beautiful white steed for a reshoeing and leaves the animal in Buster's capable hands. The scene is played largely straight, as Buster gives the horse the kind of attention, consideration, and care that a particular fashion-conscious patron in a fine department store at the time would have expected to receive. No other comedian could have played this marvelous bit, balancing sincerity with understated humor, the way Keaton does. His chemistry with this equine is palpable, and thus their scene together is nothing short of exquisite. The subject of class is often apparent in Keaton's films, and never more so than with Virginia Fox as the haughty equestrian. No one could turn on the snob like she does in a number of Keaton's shorts, and her cool reservedness towards Blacksmith Buster says volumes. It's probably not a stretch to say that the disdain she shows him on screen was a reflection of how Keaton began to perceive his relationship with his wife and her family, as well as others who regarded him as a lowly comic. And then there is the matter of the roles, not to mention the Model T, both of which Buster utterly destroys for real on camera. Many have taken the film to task not only for this destruction style of comedy, which Laurel and Hardy would later elevate to a fine art, but for Buster's sudden seeming lack of intelligence or concern. However, if you watch Keaton's performance closely in this scene, 
It's his extreme absent-mindedness combined with his total focus of attention on attempting to repair the first car that has him decimating the second one. And from this, Keaton fashions a sequence on a par with Chaplin's artful destruction of an alarm clock, albeit an exceedingly less expensive prop, in the pawn shop. Other bits of imaginativeness, repairing a pocket watch with fire and water, a saddle shock absorber, using a child's balloon to hold up a car, a rib bruising stunt involving a horse, and the double gag ending, are but a few more of the gems to be found in this dud of Keaton's. And what a glorious dud it is. <laughs>